Hello and welcome to this lecture on support vector machines, also known as SVMs, where briefly you'll be learning about what classification is and how the SVM solves the classification problem. Actually, SVM is one way of solving the classification problem. And most importantly, we'll see the connection of SVM with convex optimization. So we'll start off by how SVM works. Then we'll see how the SVM problem is formulated through convex optimization. We'll see the primal and dual problems of the SVM, followed by the optimal solution of the SVM. Last but not least, we're going to see a MATLAB implementation of the SVM method. So without further ado, let's get started. So let's say I've got the following data points, right? We're going to call them x1 down till xn. That is, this guy is x1, this guy is x2. Now the ordering doesn't matter, right? So I can just come here and label this x3, x4, down till x, got 12 points over here, so x12, right? Each of those points lie in a p-dimensional space. That is, each of those points could be regarded as vectors. And obviously here in this example, I've got p equal to 2. I've got the x-axis and the y-axis, right? Or x1, x2. Now, it's sometimes useful to stack those data points in a data matrix x as such. So x1 transpose. If our x's are column vectors, then I'll stack them as rows, right? That said, my x matrix is of size n by p, right? As you can see, the data points are classified. So we've got the red class and the blue class. Now, without loss of generality, let's say the red classes are assigned a value of plus 1. So we attach to each of those red data points a value plus 1. Likewise, we're going to attach to the blue data points a value minus 1, right? So I've got a y vector that contains values y1 down to yn. My y's are discrete. This, of course, could be generalized to even more levels. So I could have further classes and say y equal 2, 3, 4, and so on. But for simplicity, let's restrict ourselves to this case that is a two-level or binary case. So with x1, I have a value attached to it, which is y equal plus 1, x2, y equal plus 1, x3, y equal minus 1, and so forth. The SVM, or Suffered Vector Machine, solves the following problem. So given a set of training examples, so those are the training sets, x1 down to x12, along with their y's, we could express the training class as the set of all x's and y. So the matrix x and its corresponding vector y that is attached to each of x's rows, right? So given this set, or examples in machine learning terms, the SVM method will build a model that assigns new examples to arriving data. But what does that mean? But first of all, what is classification, right? So the problem of classification is, you know, you've got a new arriving point, let's say this triangle right here, and, you know, the classification problem is based on X and Y, so based on those given red and blue data points, I want to know how the green point looks like. Is it a circle or is it a square? There's many classification algorithms in the field of machine learning and so on, such as logistic regression, KNN, naive bias, decision trees, and so forth, right? And all those guys, their job is to answer this one question. Given T, that is X and Y, how do I assign a new arriving point, which is the triangle you see in front of you? Is it team red or team blue, okay? Now, SVM is one type of algorithm or method that does this assignment or classification. Assuming that our data set is linearly separable, that is, roughly speaking, I could fit a line between the two classes, as you can see in front of you, SVM's job is to derive an optimal line, hopefully the, the black line, that best 
or fairly separates or segregates the two classes. Okay, SVM will find this line using maximum margin. What does that mean? Now, I really don't want to bore you with boring terms like maximum margin or I don't know what, but this is what it is. I'm going to explain what maximum margin means, okay? So first things first, how many lines could I fit between those two classes? Infinite, right? So I have many choices that I could fit between, you know, those two classes. But what, let's pick some extreme cases, right? So I could easily fit a blue line as such, but why would we not favor the blue line? Because it's so close to the, you know, it doesn't look nice, right? It's so close to the blue class. That means new arriving points, such as the green one, will tend to be classified as red more than blue, right? Now, the other extreme case is the red line, right? So the red line is closer to the red class. As one might suspect, the black line is somewhere in between. Now, the blue hyperplane is usually referred to as the negative. Likewise, the red one is referred to as the positive hyperplane. The black line is placed, or the black hyperplane is placed in such a way that the margin between the two hyperplanes is maximized. That is, this red and blue distances are maximized, okay? So we're trying to, you know, push as much as we can here between the two classes. We're trying to, you know, find the, the extreme hyperplanes, the positive and the negative ones. And then we'll come and insert the maximum margin hyperplane, right? So maximum margin is to insert a line between two closest points of different classes in a way that the distance from this hyperplane, black one, to each of the extreme points, so let's say this one and this one, is maximized, okay? Why is that? It's because those extreme hyperplanes, the negative and positive ones, are supporting the extreme points, which are the closest towards each other. So you've got this point and this point. They're, if you will, the, the head of their classes. They're the closest to each other from different classes, right? So the maximum margin hyperplane will come and sit midway between those two points, right? And by the way, those two points that you see, they have a name. They're called the support vector. So no wonder why this method is called the support vector machine. Said inform, inform, those two points are supporting all the algorithm, which means that if you get rid of all the other points, the optimal line, the maximum margin hyperplane, will remain the same, right? Because the negative and positive hyperplanes are still there. They're still the same ones, and therefore the maximum margin hyperplane will still sit in between the two hyperplanes, which are intact. They're still the same. So whether the other non-support vectors are, are there or not, they're useless. That said, all the other points do not contribute to the resulting model. So yeah, this is in short what BSVM does, right? So how to formulate this problem mathematically, first of all, before going into the convex optimization aspect of the SVM, how is this written down as a concrete mathematical problem. Well, first of all, we can regard the SVM as a linear classifier because the problem here now is just to find the normal vector beta. So the hyperplane takes the following form, beta transpose x plus b. So if I have a new arriving point xi such that xi lies on the red side, then this guy should be positive. Therefore, I will assign a yi, which is plus 1. This is the decision rule, right? Else, if it lies on the blue part, that is, if it's negative, then yi is assigned the value minus 1. So this is really the decision rule. You can write both of these equations as one equation. Note that this quantity multiplied by yi is always positive. So this guy is always positive, okay? Now, this is a linear classification type of formulation. We shouldn't forget that in SVM we have a certain margin, 
which is the blue arrow over here and the red arrow over here. So without loss of generality, let's say this margin is a constant C, which will set throughout the problem to 1. It doesn't matter how much I set it, as long as it's not 0. So I'll take a margin of 1, so I'll replace those boundary conditions by 1 and minus 1. So minus 1 is the blue level hyperplane and the, and the plus 1 is the red level hyperplane. That said, the single equation formulation should also be replaced by a 1 over here. Okay. Now, as we said previously, we would like to maximize the distance between the two hyperplanes, right? The red and the blue. Now, one way of doing so is to imagine yourself on the negative hyperplane, the blue one, one, and you would want to walk towards the red hyperplane, the positive hyperplane. Well, you can express this using a single equation, which is parametrized via beta, b, and how much you would like to walk, a parameter c, which serves as a magnitude of the vector beta, right? So let's say this is beta, parallel to this beta, and I am on the blue hyperplane, which has the equation beta transpose x plus b, which is equal to minus 1, or alternatively, beta transpose x plus b plus 1 is 0. So you're on this blue hyperplane and you would like to walk towards the red hyperplane, which has the equation beta transpose x plus b minus 1 is 0. So the variable here is x. And to walk from one hyperplane to another, it's really simple. You'd want to augment your x by a certain quantity. So beta transpose x plus a certain quantity plus b plus 1 is 0, which is also beta transpose x plus b minus 1. So this is the red hyperplane and this is the blue hyperplane. So how much do we want to walk first of all? In which direction do you want to walk? It's in the direction of beta. And how much? Well, it's a c beta. c is a quantity, right? So if we rearrange this equation, we get beta transpose x plus c beta transpose beta plus b plus 1 is beta transpose x plus b minus 1, right? As you can see, the beta transpose x cancels, the b cancels. You're left with c beta transpose beta is equal to the minus 2. Well, that's because the normal vector will be pointing this way, right? It's always towards the negative gradient. So this is a plus or minus 2. So to avoid the confusion, which set plus 2. So we get C norm of beta is 2, right? So how much is C? It is 2 over the norm of beta squared. So C actually reports a certain distance, right? How much we're walking. So we would like to maximize this distance. So the problem here is to maximize c, right, which is 2 over the norm of beta square, subject to the decision rule constraints. That is the single equation formulation, this one or this one. Now, the maximization, of course, is going to take place with respect to beta and b, because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the normal vector and the intercept of the hyperplane. Right Now, since we're maximizing 1 over a term, it's the equivalent of minimizing that term. So equivalently, we can say that we want to minimize the denominator, which is beta square, subject to the same constraints. Right Now, if we look at this problem, and if you've been watching my convex optimization series, you could easily recognize this problem as a QP problem, which is a quadratic cogram because it's written in the form of x transpose px plus q transpose x plus r subject to affine equality and inequality constraints. My x here is the beta, my p is identity, q and r are zero, and the g is your xi stacked in a matrix x along with the b. You get to scale your matrix with yi and your right hand side is a one. You can also insert negative sign so that this greater than sign becomes a less than sign, right? So this is a quadratic program. What is the corresponding Lagrangian function of this problem? So the Lagrangian is in terms of 
beta and b and some Lagrangian multipliers lambda which will turn out here to be super important they report super interesting results and in particular they will tell us who are the support vectors it's going to pick the relevant data points which will turn out to be the support vectors and focus on those two data points so as to perform the SVM. Okay, we'll see that later on in the MATLAB implementation. So back here, it's the cost function plus sum of lambda i is multiplied by your inequality constraints. Well, since this is a greater than sign and in all convex optimization problems, we've got to minimize a certain cost subject to f i of x less than zero. So for that, we're going to say one minus the left hand side which is less than zero so we're going to take that over here and say one minus let the transpose xi plus b y i where i goes from one till n right you could extract the minus sign over here which could be written as such so let's find the optimal points beta and b that maximize the lagrangian so for that i'm going to derive l with respect to beta you will get since here is the beta in norm square, you will get two beta. And since you've got a beta common in all the summations, you will get the sum over this part over here only. The rest is independent of beta. So this will be lambda i, xi, yi. Set it to zero. This means that your beta is half summation from one till n lambda i x i y i okay now i don't like this half <laughs> you could get rid of it and the lambda i's will configure automatically this is really important this is the equivalent of saying oh so instead of minimizing x square i'm going to minimize half x square the same problem you're going to get the same solution but a different optimal value not an optimal point an optimal value will differ just divided by half but the optimal point is the same so if i go ahead here and say i want to minimize half beta square here i will have a half so as here the two half will become a one and thus i can get rid of this half okay you can scale as much as you want with a positive number okay so your beta is this and now derive with respect to b you will get only this part over here. So yi with the lambda i. So that said, you will get minus sum lambda i, yi is zero. As you can see, we didn't get b. We didn't get a first order condition on b, but the derivative with respect to b gave us the following condition. That is that the sum of lambda i, yi should be zero. So those are the two conditions. Okay, the beta star should satisfy this equation at lambda i star. Don't forget that xi and yi are, are given. We're not solving for xi and yi, they're given. They're the training examples. A really important question here is that are we done? No, we're not. So, what's next? To finish, we need to know what my lambda i stars are. What are the optimal Lagrangian multipliers? In SVM, they have a really nice interpretation. They highlight who is and who is not the support vectors, okay? How can we see this? We have to formulate the dual Lagrangian problem, which I talked about in one of my lectures entitled Lagrangian dual problem. What we basically did in short was that for every primal or main optimization problem, we have a corresponding dual problem, which is to maximize the dual function subject to non-negativity constraints on the Lagrangian multipliers. So let's do that. Now, of course, we need to be more concrete to see if strong or weak duality holds, stuff like that. But let's focus on the SVM part here, first of all. So what is the Lagrangian dual function, which is g of lambda over here? It is the infimum over your variables, beta and b, of the Lagrangian function. In our problem, we can simply replace the optimal values beta star and b star while leaving lambda to be free. So let's replace them in L. We get half norm of beta star square minus the sum over my lambda i's 
beta star transpose xi plus b star yi minus 1 as such, right? Next, replace the form of beta star, that is half norm of this guy, which could be written. I'm going to change an index here to avoid confusion with the first index. So this guy will be lambda. So we've got a beta star here, which is the sum over i, lambda i, x, i, y, i. Well, I'm going to change the index so that it's a j to avoid confusion with the first index. We get a lambda j, right? x, j, y, j. All transpose with the x, i plus b star multiplied by y, i minus 1 and such. So let's expand this. Don't forget that for a vector in norm square, it is x transpose x. So this guy becomes summation over i and j, lambda i, lambda j, x i transpose x j, and the y i, y j, right? And this guy over here, if we expand a bit, we get a double sum over i and j, going from 1 to n, lambda i, lambda j, x j transpose x i and y j y i and we've got the b part over here which is lambda i y i b star and we've got the sum over lambdas we've got a minus and a minus which is a plus now if we turn on the first order of conditions note that b star is a constant and hence it could be extracted outside the summation we've got that the sum of lambda i y i is zero this guy is zero. And we've got the same summation here appearing twice, half summation minus one, the same summation. So we get minus half that same summation over i and j, lambda i, lambda j, x i, transpose x j, y i, y j, plus the sum over lambda i, okay? Now in matrix term, we can easily express this horrible looking equation in terms of summation, we can express it in matrix term as simple as lambda transpose P lambda plus Q transpose lambda, right? Where my P, and to be consistent with the notation of references, I'm going to leave the half over here. And since we're going to maximize G of lambda, the subject to lambda positive, this is the dual problem. Instead, I'm going to minimize the negative of g lambda because we're going to be using a MATLAB function which is the quad prog, solves a quadratic program. You can see that the objective function is quadratic so we're going to minimize the negative of this guy. So the negative of this guy is, let's see here we've got a minus over here. Let's extract this minus, right? So we get this minus this, okay, the minus sign is outside. So the P matrix over here will have in its ijth entry this quantity. So it's xi transpose xj yi yj, okay? And Q is all ones, right? So QI is one. Okay, good. So this is the dual problem which will tell us what my lambda i's are. So that we're done, right? So writing the dual more clearly, we're going to have to minimize half lambda transpose p lambda minus q transpose lambda subject to lambdas being positive. Do I have any more constraint over here on lambda? Well, yes. What is it? It's this guy over here. Why? Because it tells us that there's a sort of orthogonality between y's and lambdas. So I have to include it here. This constraint lambda i y i equal to zero could be written as lambda transpose y is zero, okay? So the constraint here is lambda transpose y or y transpose lambda is zero. So it's a QP, it's a quadratic program as well that will tell me what my lambda star is depending on the problem, okay? So a remaining question here is, okay, if this dual problem, call it D, will, will give me lambda star, I can go back up here, plug it in lambda i star, and I'll get my beta star. Well, okay, you got beta star, but what is B star? Well, you could choose B star to be, since yi should be equal to beta xi plus B, 
right, then it should also be equal at the optimal value, right? So in other words, we can choose our B star to be Yi minus beta star Xi. And to be more concrete, you could take the average. So 1 over n sum Yi minus beta star Xi. So let me show you how to implement SVM on MATLAB. So here I've got MATLAB open. Now open an empty script. So I'll clear everything out. And the first thing you'd want to do for if you have a data set, that's good, but I'll just generate random ones. So I'm going to choose a P equal to two, two dimensions, and let's say 10 data points. So one class, I'll call them X1, they're centered at one with some noise around one, that is. It generates some Gaussian noise. I'll take half the data points in class X1 and the other ones in class X2, which are centered at 2, 2. And for X1, we'll attach labels Y1 and Y2, okay? Now, what I just did here is that I assigned half the data points to class X1 and the other ones for class X2. It will turn out useful to define a proportion of, say, 0 0.5 and just let it scale automatically. So we'll multiply by prop, that is proportion, take the floor, and the rest will be assigned to x2, so n minus the ones for x1. Likewise for the y's, okay? Now we see that this value is computed twice, so I can just compute it over here, over here, 1, and n2 will be n minus n1. Let's, let's say lowercase n, it looks better, right? So this guy is of size n1, so is y1, and y2 will be n2, okay? Now just to visualize stuff, I'm going to open a figure and plot x1, so the first column versus the second column, and to be consistent with the drawing here, since x1 is centered at 1, 1, I imagine that we're somewhere here. So x1 will be in blue, so blue x's will hold on to plot in red, right? And there you have it, so 1 and 2, right? If you want to, you know, you have a, a constant scale, well, and come here and say x limb and y limb. Yeah, you're setting the limits. And then you can go ahead and define your x limit somewhere here. Right? So I'll just say it's from 0 to 4, so as the y, from 0 to 4. Okay, as you can see, my x and y go from 0 to 4. Okay, good. Now let's implement SVM. So, so for that, let's define a beta, which is initially zero, and a b, which is also initially zero. This is my beta star and b star. Next, let's implement this equation over here, beta star. So for k going from one to n, we want to implement this summation, lambda i, xi, yi. So how do I do that? Beta plus a lambda, k. It's really simple to define them from x1 and x2. All I have to do is concatenate x1 on top of x2, and so as y, y1 over y2, right? So in that case, I'll refer to xk as the kth row of x, multiplied by the kth entry of y, right? So this is my beta, and after I have my beta, I'll go ahead and compute my b by a simple average, so one over n, multiplied by yk, so in case you're wondering, I'm using this equation over here, okay? So yk minus beta times xk. Don't forget to transpose your xk. Okay, but there's still one more problem. It's the lambda. We don't have the lambda. We just said here that lambda solves this problem over here, right? Where my p is this, my q is this. Well, so my p, we need to have a specific block over here to compute the lambdas. We'll define as zeros. First of all, for my P, and my Q is all ones, right? So let's fill in P by a double loop. So my P should contain this quantity over here, Xi transpose, Xj, Yi, Yj. So let's write it down, Xi transpose, Xj, multiplied by Yi and Yj, right? So now we have the P and Q, let's solve the problem. So for that, we're going to use 
the quad frog. And the quad frog solves a quadratic program, right? With the following parameters. We're going to use this call over here. So H, F, H is the P, F is the Q, A and B's are, are empty. A equality and B equality are defined by Y transposing zero. Don't forget that the lambda should be positive, so the lower bound could be zero, and the upper bound is a user specified parameter. So for that, let's do this. So quad prog P and minus Q, Y minus Q, because there's a minus over here. Then A quality and B quality are empty. Then we've got this constraint over here. Y transpose lambda is zero. Well, Y transpose and zero. Then you've got the lower bound and upper bound, right? UB and LB. Let's define them here. LB is zeros of size n, and, and the UB is, let's say, 100. So the upper bound on all my lambdas is 100. Okay, looks good. Let's run. Oh, okay, so there is an error over here. This guy should be a transpose. Okay, looks good. Okay, so let's see how the lambdas look like. And it's all zeros. And why is that? Because of a silly mistake over here. Y2 should be minus one. So we can't, so you can't assign both classes the same value Y, right? You have to differentiate. So plus one and minus one. Run again. This is the data, lambda, and there you go. As you see, only two lambdas are not zero. The rest are zero. And it's because the XI is corresponding to this guy. And this guy are the support vectors. And to see that, well, let's run again. If we look at this drawing, what are the two closest points that are not of the same class? It's this guy and this guy, right? So it's those two points. Well, let's run again. Got this lambda, two points, and zero. So if you look at this figure over here, the suffered vectors by observation is this guy and this guy, or, or the one next to it. Now we'll check. Okay, so let's look at x1. Now in x1, as lambda will pick, it's the third index, right? So the third index is 1.09, that is 1.1, and 1.128. So this guy is the first SV, the first suffered vector. Now the second one, if we look at lambda again, it's the first index of X2. So X2, it's 2.01 and 1.636, as we see here, right? So lambda, the Lagrangian multiplier vector, did a, did a job in picking the suffered vectors, right? Now, one thing is missing, let's plot the maximum margin hyperplane. So for that, we can go over here and create an x-axis. So this guy is the optimal hyperplane or the maximum margin hyperplane. Let's define an x-axis that spans the x limits, take a thousand points, let's define an empty yk, and let's loop over all the x values and x-axis and each time append a value that corresponds to beta transpose x plus b is equal to zero. So for that, you've got two vectors, beta one, beta two, x one, x two. I'm interested in writing this as x two in terms of x one. So for that, you're going to get, you can write it on a piece of paper. It's really easy to see. It is minus beta two times x minus b over beta one, right? And on the same figure, you're going to plot yk versus x-axis. So run, and there you see it. Run again, and again, and again. Now to be more, you know, precise, we can highlight the support vectors thanks to lambda. So from lambda, I'm going to pick a portion of lambda that corresponds to the first class, that is the first n1 entries, and the others go from n plus one till the n, right? So run, lambda one is of size I meant n1 over here. Run, lambda 1 is of size n over 2, lambda 2 as well. So we're interested in picking the entry that is not 0, right? Now, you might face some round of errors if you base your decision upon values that are not 0. So if you look for lambda 1 that are 0, it's false all over. You see that the first four entries are 0. But in fact, they're very, very small, such that MATLAB doesn't detect or decide that they're zero. For that, we're just going to pick the maximum value, right? So from lambda one, I'm going to pick a K1. 
to find lambda 1, that is max lambda 1, right? Likewise, so this is the index of the support vector, right? So we indicated k1 and k2. So on the same figure, I'm going to highlight x1, k1, and x1, k1 in, let's say, black. Or let's highlight it with a larger line width, right? So 3, 1. So line width 3. Let's choose a marker size over here. That is, that is 5. Still not getting it. So I'll go here and x, b. And there you see it, it's over there. Run again, and again, and again. It's the one that is closest to the hyperplane. So I'm going to do the same thing for x2, but with a red color. And there you go. Those are your support vectors, right? Run and run. I took a larger data set, so 100 points. There's your support vector. So cool, right? Let's give it a larger marker size. Okay, looks good. It took 1,000 points look messy. I'm going to take some time actually. Actually, there you have it. Set it back to 100. And there you go. So yeah, that's it for this lecture. We discussed what classification is, one method to solve the classification problem in machine learning, that is the SVM, how to formulate and derive the optimal solution of the SVM. We gave a simple MATLAB example and the MATLAB implementation of SVM. We also talked about the interpretations of the Lagrangian multipliers in this case, which tell us or highlight the support vectors that are relevant to the SVM method. Thanks for watching. In case you found this video beneficial, please consider subscribing to the channel and liking the video. If you have any questions, just comment down below in the comment section and I'll make sure I'll reply as soon as possible. Thank you so much and I'll see you then.